right. Uh, yeah, so like Marcus was saying, my name is Justin Walsh. Um, I work at Rainbow Studios here in the Valley. Uh, we work on the MX vs. ATV franchise, uh, making motocross games. Uh, quite a few folks in the, in the room are, work with us down there. Um, technical director over there, so I do more um, scheduling than code writing these days and firefighting. But I uh, pinged a couple dudes I work with. They gave me some good tips. I collected all the tips I could over the last, you know, four or five months of kind of diving into Unreal for a full production game and what that means to us and kind of the things that we run into that I just were not super obvious and took like serious Google foo and patience and testing to figure out. Um, so that's that's what we're gonna get going on. What up? Uh, so, I got, a, I got an agenda for us, I uh, hope we can read that. Here's everything that I hope to go over today. Um, some super easy, but I just had no idea they were there until someone came to my computer and was like, yo, did you know about this? So some of these are just, yo, did you know about this type stuff, and some of these are pretty intense. Uh, so we're talking about Frustrum Select, uh, everything is super, um, and how super class is, what that means. Ready, set, begin, play. Um, talk about about the uh, begin play and what it means and how it fires and the order it fires in uh, differences between uh, when you dive into unreal you have all these places you could put your code uh, game mode game instance game state player state um, and it's often mysterious where and why you should put your code where um, and by code I mean blueprints or C++ because with unreal typically everything that I can do in C++ you can do in blueprints um, yeah and sometimes there's stuff you can't get to and you have to go to C++ and expose it to blueprints yourself. But um, a lot of this stuff will apply on both, on both sides. Uh, this thing called the Asset Registry. Um, uh, Unreal Engine and the editor use it extensively in every panel that you're using inside of the editor. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and show a little bit about what that means and how you can kind of leverage some of that power for your, your game. Uh, macros, functions, events, I'm pretty sure we've drilled it in numerous times with multiple blueprint example uh, presentations here, but I just kind of have a hit list, like a high level, remember these things about um, when doing blueprints about what a macro function and event gets you. Uh, localization, no one likes localization, no one talks about localization, localization sucks. We'll talk a little bit about it. <laughs> uh, 3D user interface, uh, almost, got a clever hack. Um, I was going to show you. And then the last one, custom thunk, aka advanced poop emoji. Um, this is like some serious C++ stuff that uh, we leverage to expose the blueprints on our title, and it gives us a lot of, a lot of power. Uh, but in order to implement it, you, you may need some good dark C++ skills to pull it off. But it's super cool um, tech. So I wanted to throw that at everyone, and by that point, everyone will be tired and sleeping that doesn't care anyway, so who wants to listen can listen. Um, and I can jump back and forth into the editor at any time if anyone wants me to kind of show, it, show them an example of anything I'm talking about, but I'm planning on mostly doing a lot of talking until someone says, hey, can we see that? And then we'll go, we'll go off into the editor and explore it a little bit. Uh, and if we don't get through all of these in the time limit, then we don't so I think that's fine though because it's, I want to have more of like a back and forth um, if if it's beneficial if it's not we'll just blaze through so uh, when you're in perspective mode if you push control alt and you drag it puts a little box on the screen and it'll grab everything that is in the view in the frustrum had no idea you could do that and it's super freaking awesome and we might as well just show that because that one's easy to show um, I might have a hard time doing it without a mouse, but we'll try. So whatever your camera's pointing at, control, is it command control on Apple? Uh, I'm sorry, what's the, what's the cord? It's control, alt, drag on Windows. Do you know what that is on Mac? It, it should, it's probably command. If it's command, not, alt. It might command, control. alt, there it is. So then it brings up a little box, and it like uses that box and casts a ray into the scene and selects all the things that are in that box. Um, so things that are like, uh, only the things inside the box or things behind it too? Like, did it get the landscape as well? 
Yeah, landscape it did too, because it literally like it's taking a box from the screen, and it's like projecting it through the world in 3D space, as if you just like took that box and shot it all the way to the end of the frustrum. So anything that's clipped, like as soon as you start pulling your camera back and it starts clipping stuff in the background, it won't select that stuff because it's not valid. Um, it becomes pretty cool and useful, but it can also over select a lot of times stuff you don't want. And uh, on Mac, it's Command Alt click. So whoever said that got it. But yeah, so you can like. The idea is if there's a lot of stuff, it's easier to deselect a couple things. So right. you try yeah. Individually and it selects based on like their bounding boxes too. Okay. So it's not it's not like a pixel perfect select. It's just like this general kind of like I got a bunch of crap in that area. My camera's pointing over there. I want to grab it. And then yeah, filter out the things that you don't want or whatever. Or for more preci precise selection, um, when you go into ortho, you already have like a box select that they give you, which I think you just right click and drag, I can't remember. And uh, you can just do like an ortho box select, but I didn't know when in this mode, you can hit those little key combo and, and select the things. So it's kind of cool, like I grabbed those two, Lan landscape hit that too. Um, Uh, everything is super. Basically, when you're using blueprints and you have a begin play or a tick that's just sitting in your blueprint graph, which pretty much every time you go into a new blueprint you get those, um, if you just start dragging nodes off and it executes your code, anything that that blueprint may have inherited from, that execution will stop right there. Um, because technically, when you, when you hit your begin play, you're defining exactly the steps you want your blueprint to take for that guy. Um, we found this out the hard way because we were working on this like really intense juggling of state to do some uh, pause magic because the deep, the built-in pause didn't do what we wanted it to do. So we basically had to have a, a base blueprint that had a bunch of logic in it that said, when in this fake pause mode, adjust your tick calculation to be real instead of zero which was coming from the engine because it was paused and do some weird like we're also doing a lot of time manipulation stuff so we have to override the time dilation of things that we don't want to be affected by that and then we made a subclass of that guy and um, drug out some custom logic that needed to happen on his uh, on his tick and then the he the code that was in the base class wasn't wasn't executing anymore because you have to actually tell it to execute the code that your parent gave you um, so it's like if it falls off, they can turn it back on. Yeah, so I have a blueprint right here. And like, so on begin play, you know, normally you're going to drag out here and. Oh, fucking Mac. Uh, I don't know. I just want to print a string. If this, um, in this hierarchy, where'd this guy come from? I'm pretty sure this blueprint, class settings, his parent parent class is actually a C++ class uh, from this drop down. I just know that because I was working on this last night. Um, so what would happen here is if in my parent begin play C++ class I had something that said like you know initialize this, initialize that, and then I did the print string um, here. Now that this is connected my parent super like initialization call would would not execute. Um, then if you come here I think you have to say uh, oh, what the hell is it called? Call to super function. Add call to parent function. Yay. So now <laughs> When I execute, it'll print my string and then go back up to whoever his parent is and also execute whatever his chain is. Um, this, this Usually, we just don't have logic in like big and play except for in a blueprint. And this didn't bite us until we started like noticing we had a common pattern of all these things that do the same thing. And then we had one-offs that just needed to do something slightly different. And then our, our code wasn't running anymore when we started subclassing those blueprints by you know, saying, give me, make a duplicate of this guy or make his parent this guy. Uh, we added that in, and everything's cool. And pretty much any function that you do it, you can do a add call to parent function. 
and pass, uh, if it takes a variable, you need to pass your variable back through as well. It won't do it for you. So that. So, so that's on any class method or event that, that's, that's available? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, there's certain, um, what is it, the blueprint native functions, mm -hmm. which it kind of brings you into a different flow over here in the event graph. In the, uh, in the functions, you'll see like those guys over there, and then you implement a body for them. When you do it that way, it'll, it'll implicitly say like, yo, you need to call your super, or it'll give you a node to call your super class so it knows that it's executing a function and then going back into C++ land and doing what it needs to do. But with the begin play, I thought it was just implicit until it bit us in the ass, so. Um, so if you ever have a blueprint that inherits from a C++ class or a blueprint that inherits from a blueprint, and you want to chain logic, um, that add call to, to super add call to parent is going to be your friend for that. And anytime, if you have questions, stop me. We don't have to wait till the end. Uh, ready, set, begin, play. I uh, just wanted to call out that begin, play, order is not guaranteed at all. And uh, you will test something, and it looks like it works, and you're really happy and you then package the game and you test the exact same thing you just did and nothing works. And the reason you might run into this is let's say in the begin play of one of your actors, you're like, hey, go find me all the trees around me and put them in this array and then do some math on them and then I'm gonna figure out what the closest tree is and put an arrow that points to the closest tree. Um, that's all fine and dandy if all the trees did their begin plays in the right order and set up their state for you to then do the begin play and then go and find them. Um, so that if you have dependencies between two is where you can get yourself into trouble. If you just are checking for the existence of the actor in the world in your begin play, you're probably safe. But if you're like, hey, give me, so let's take the tree example, give me the, all the trees, but then also once I get the trees, I want to actually go and read a variable off of my tree that like is this tree something I care about and that variable that is on that tree was set in his begin play to a true so now when I grab all the trees all of these trees have not set their flag to true yet or maybe they did I don't know it's it's not guaranteed so you can get yourself into a lot of trouble by making assumptions that things are loaded and in the right state in the begin play and typically where this bites you the most is when you are packaging the game for a milestone delivery or a demo or a game jam or anything where you have absolutely no time to actually deal with stuff like this and you're trying to get the thing out the door, that's when begin play creeps its, like pops its ugly head up and is like, nope, you're not good. Because as soon as you package the game, it changes the order in which your assets load. Um, it may change the order in which your assets load. It may not, you might get lucky. And then one day an artist comes along, adds another tree, all of a sudden things are happening in a different order. Um, and you have no control over that. So what you do instead is you never assume in begin play that the state or variable or blueprint has even run for another object yet. You can't, you can't make that determination there. So really what they want you to do is look into these other classes, the game instance or the game mode, which will have methods that fire when you can guarantee that everyone's begin play has been executed. And then you can go and tell your things, okay, go and collect, you know, the trees around you you care about. Go and do these other things. Do these things in this order that I need you to do them in. Um, don't just rely on an actor getting called in the right order. I can't really show you a demo of that um, because it's like a phantom ghost to make happen, but it's an annoying phantom ghost. Could you also uh, have a Your arrow pointing blueprint is at least going to have that array available, right? You can call a function on that blueprint. Yeah. That so add a thing to that array. if, like in your in your example, if you added uh, an array as a public variable over, uh, let's go look. So you're saying, like, if over here I said variables and I added one and I told it it's an array of booleans or probably like an array of actors called, yeah, array of actors. you know, called trees, and then I call this trees. 
And then here I want it to be uh, actor, give me actor reference. Um, and then I had that public, or maybe I had a function called like register tree or something like that, which would just add me to this array. Uh, that would work because these variables are here the minute the thing is spawned and begin play does get called after everything is technically spawned. Um, but if in your begin play you said, you know, set the array size to 20 and then your trees literally said, hey, I'm tree zero, I'm tree one, I'm tree two, um, there's a chance that your array hasn't been set to the right size yet and now the trees are going to blow up your array because it's not the right size kind of thing. So that, that's where you get into trouble. But yeah, if you're just asking like default initialized state of things, when Unreal loads and spawns an object in, everything that's over here and over here in these class defaults, those get serialized in when they're spawned. So all the settings that are on the right side here and all the variables that you have marked public over here are available the minute it's spawned. And other guys can ask questions about them um, using the pattern you're talking about where the tree tells the other guy, hey, I'm ready. But then the thing that you wouldn't know is on this guy's begin play, that may fire before all the trees have notified me that they are ready. Sure. And then if my begin play said, okay, I got all the trees, pick one, and then four more trees notified me, um, if I didn't then account for that, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't have any complete picture of that, that gameplay system I was trying to make. Um, but what you could do is there, uh, and I scoured, I can't remember the damn name of the method, but there is a thing on game mode um, that gets fired once everything is loaded. All begin plays have been called, I think it's called like matches ready or matches about to start or something like that. And that one, you could then say, okay, now go and gather all my state, tell everyone exactly what they need to do, and then let's start the game kind of thing. Um, and that's a much better pattern that's way more consistent and way easier to follow in the long run. Can I suggest one more that you and I as a factory used before? Yeah. It's uh, basically what you do is um, if you need a thing that's like global, like your tree arrow manager or something like that, um, and you need to access it from somewhere else, like your level blueprint, for example, and you know that it hasn't been initialized, what you can do is you can go and call an initialization function or event on it, knowing that as soon as you call it, it's going to run through all of your blueprint nodes that initialize that thing for you. So that way, the gameplay can still be called wherever it needs to be called, but you're, you're guaranteed that that thing is initialized where you want it, and then you can do whatever operations that you made available right. um, on that on that particular thing. So that, that's another way to kind of combat this, this issue. Cool. Or feature, rather. Yeah, feature. Uh, game mode, game instance, game state, player state. Uh, how many people in here have even looked at those blueprint classes or classes in their life? And was like, hey, that's a thing. Cool. Someone's going to appreciate this. Uh, so, the first thing that you're going to do when you make your first Unreal Engine uh, game is you're going to go, ah, I just want to make a quick demo. I only need one player. That player is me. I'm going to put all my logic in game mode. Um, and you are going to be good as long as you never make that a multiplayer game ever in your life. <laughs> the minute you say, oh, I need to get more people in here, you're now rewriting all of your code that you just did because you stuck it in the wrong spot because I feel that Epic, I get why they do it, but I feel like they, re they, they lead you down the wrong path. They're always like, all of their examples that are single player only, they always give you a game mode where all their logic is, and that's because when you are making a single player game, you are the server and the client at the exact same time. So if there's only one player, you can put all your logic in the server because you are the server. The minute you connect a second player, one of you is the server. And then that's when things will just start going crazy. Well, you'll notice it's not behaving because in the, in the second guy, there is no game mode. He does not even have a game mode. So he literally will do nothing if he has there's not, if there's no code anywhere other than game mode, when you get the second guy in there, he's just going to do all of his default crap that's baked into Unreal Engine 4, and he's not going to be doing the stuff that you want him to do. Um, the game mode is only on the server, and it is the authority. And I would use game mode if making a single-player game, or even 
Maybe, no, I think split screen will still screw you too. I don't know about split screen. You have to, you have to check into that. Um, but the minute you, if you, if at any time in creation of your project, you think that an multiplayer online game is what you want to make, um, then don't just dump all your code into game mode. It's basically what I'm saying. And I would go one further and say, if you are making a single player game, don't dump all your code into game mode either, because eventually you're going to make it a multiplayer game. Probably you're going to at least mess around with it. Right. Because unreal engine gives you all of these tools exposed out to blueprint level to where literally like you just check a box and online play is happening if everything's set up correctly. It'll start replicating values across and everyone will be aware of every other and as long as you just follow their model, um, online play can be as easy as a few check boxes and a few callbacks and then it can be way harder once you start realizing that like lag is a thing and prediction and and physics and all other kinds of crap that's not fun um but like turn based you're making like a turn based game or something like it'll it'll handle that no problem um, you said you're not sure about split screen what about common screen multiplayer it seems like that probably would still work yeah that one should uh the difference would be down in these other um the player state thing i'll talk about a little further down but yeah that should still have one game mode if you have Two guys plugged in, one viewport running around. I think split screen is still one game mode. Um, I just don't know who's the authority. I'm pretty sure it's on the whole client, so I'm pretty sure it would still work with the split screen too. Uh, but then the minute you added in a, an external box, you'd find yourself in a different world. Um, so the I'll come back to game mode too as I, I'll go through them and I'll come back and put them back in, in order again. Uh, game instance. This thing is only on the client, but it's on each and every client. So every time a new client opens up your game, a game instance is made. Um, all of these can be uh, blueprinted too. You can make blueprint implementations of all of these classes to put custom functions in them. So the game instance, it runs on each and every client as well as the server because he has a game instance too. Um, and it persists the life of the game. So what we started doing on our project, and I think it's a pretty good pattern and it hasn't bit us yet, is the game instance is one of the very, very first things. It gets its init called. There's a function called init on it and it gets called right away. And toward like after you have a world but before you have anything else, it, it kind of is there and it exists. Um, so what we do a lot of times is we have a lot of like uh, systems that need to be around the lifetime of the game and you need to be able to ask things, questions of these systems at any given time. So instead of having an actor that we put in the world and then we put in every world, uh, we put on our game instance, we add um, objects to them that we can then ask questions about. So examples of stuff like this would be uh, we have a save game manager and he's the guy that tells us when a game is saving, when the game has loaded. Um, you can ask him to save the game at any time and that's persisted through the entire life of the game. It's available anywhere at any time. Uh, we have uh, like these database type systems where we have like if you had uh, items, right? If you're doing a game that you needed like an inventory, um, you're, well, no, it's not true. Your inventory would probably exist on your player state. Um, but anything, or maybe if you had your individual player inventory would exist on player state, but if you had like a collection of all the inventory that's available and you wanted to ask questions against that, then you want to put that probably on the game instance where you can say, uh, inventory manager, tell me how many different potion types there are. Tell me, um, you know, the ID of this potion or, you know, just stuff like that. So that's what we do with our game is we put little managers on the game instance because we can ask questions against that anytime, anywhere. Every client has a copy of it um, and the server knows nothing about what you're doing inside of your game instance. The server doesn't care. Game state, this thing exists on the server and every single client and not only that, but they all communicate with each other because through replication. So anytime something is changed in the game state anywhere, it will get replicated back and forth to everybody. Um, this is a great spot to put anything and everything that is specific to the current game that you are playing, but not specific to the player. Um, 
and that might be hard to differentiate until you're actually like creating a game and you're like uh, I need to keep a score across two different teams the players don't need to know the score individually because you've made a higher order collection of these three are on this team these three are on this team team a team b here score here score and anytime you know this guy makes a goal on team b the score updates everyone knows that the score was just updated it's replicated across everything and then back when you're making a single player game instead of making a game mode and putting everything there with those types of variables you can get your game multiplayer ready by using a game state to store that type of information then when you do pull the trigger on multiplayer uh, it's already good to go your, your data is going to automatically be replicated it's going to talk like you just save yourself a lot of time by putting everything into game state even though most tutorials are like oh, just throw the variable on the game mode and then player state is on the server on the client everywhere per player so each client that's running a game if he has five players connected to a server they all will have five player states one for each player so my computer your computer your computer five 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 server five and the player state literally tracks information specific to that player and it's all replicated across this is where now instead of putting your health on the game state or the game mode put your health on the player state and then when you run into objects that hurt you in the world and subtract from your health everyone else in the game knows that your health went down automatically for free so if you use these things appropriately when you are just building a quick prototype expanding it into a full multiplayer game is almost free if you follow like the secret pattern uh, that took me forever to figure out and I think the documentation on it is not super clear and there's lots of like UDN, what do they call them, uh, answer hub posts and stuff like that where people are like super confused about it and it's regurgitated over and over and over again everywhere. I hope my explanation made some sense. If not, literally type game mode versus into anything in Unreal Engine and you'll see like 2,000 posts of people all, all, all arguing and talking about how to make their game using these four crucial classes. Um, do we have any other questions on that one or need any examples? Because that's not really there one. Any reason whatsoever to use game mode? Yeah, so game mode is the only place where you should be checking the validity of an action. Um, so if, in, in, the, in the example of we have a team-based game with scoring, if I made a score, the person that determined that that score was made, that logic should be in the game mode. And then once it knows, hey, a score was made by team B, then it should update the game state saying team B score equals this. So then what happens is the server is, is the authoritative source saying a goal was made. Let's update the game state to say he got a point. And as soon as that happens, every single client gets a notification that a goal was made by team B. Instead of if you did it in the in the player state, or if you did it in the game instance, or you did it on the actor itself, he said, I kicked a goal, I made a goal, woo! Then the server is like, no idea that you made a goal. If you update the game state directly, um, that would work too, except for it's easy to cheat, because now the guy's just like, might find some kind of exploit where he can just keep triggering this thing to rack his score up. And then the server never has a chance to actually say, did he really make a goal? Was the ball really in the box? Were all these things really happening that I need to know if a goal is made? Um, so that's the type of stuff you want in your game mode. And I think that's why they say if you're making a single player game, just put all that stuff here. Because you're like the authoritative source and doing all the checking to make sure that he's following the rules of your game. But the, the part where people start to fall off on the single player versus multiplayer is they just start adding variables to their game mode and say, well, track my score here, track my health here, track my everything here, and then as soon as you go to a multiplayer <clears throat> game, you can't, no one knows what your score is, your health is, everything else. So that's where if you did a game state and a game mode, then you have a server-side authoritative action that's replicated down to everybody automatically. So game mode made a score, tell the game state, update the variable, game state behind the scenes sends that change out to everybody, everybody gets a notification and it updates. Is there any other questions on that?
And did that answer your question? All right, this one I will show you a little bit because it's crazy. So uh, Unreal Engine in the editor, there is the asset registry. And what the asset registry is actually doing for you without even knowing that you are using it is this content browser is the asset registry. When you come over to material and you hover over it and you get this additional metadata that's like microscopic on the screen, that's the asset registry that that information is stored in. Um, when you get to, I don't think I have any textures in here. When you get to things that have more fun information, oh, there's some good stuff in here. It's vertices, UV channels, materials, all that good stuff. That's your, that's your asset registry that is helping to inform this data. Uh, originally, when I first started messing with this stuff, I, I thought we have, we have a game where we have to keep track of a lot of assets because in our game you have vehicles and our vehicles have parts and we have players that have gear and we potentially could end up creating hundreds if not thousands of assets over the life of the game that all need to go on to the bike or go on to the ATV or go on to the rider and figuring out a system to manage that without loading every single asset at runtime um, is kind of a pain and there's a lot of ways you could do it. Unreal kind of short circuits some of that and gives us the asset registry. Go back to my thing here. So the asset registry is actually available at runtime, even though it's like a, it's not strictly an editor only module. You can actually use it in your package shipped game with content that's cooked, bundled on disk. You can ask questions against your assets at runtime. Um, so the way that I'm gonna leverage it and most people are leveraging it, including uh, on Unreal Tournament, they use it to um, know what the maps are that you can play. You know, they have hundreds of maps potentially toward the end of the life cycle of that product, and they need to know what maps are available for me to play on. Um, if you tag things with asset registry, and this is gonna get into some C++ stuff, so I'm just gonna walk over the basic flow. If you tag it as asset registry searchable, then what happens is when the data is packaged, it actually takes those variables and puts it into the package um, as metadata. And what that means is typically, if that, if that data was only on your asset, you would have to load that asset. You'd have to like create a default one or spawn it into the world and be like, hey man, what is the name of your level? So you have to load the map and say, what is the name of this map? And then you have to unload it. And then you'd have to load the next one and say, what is the name of this map? And you have to unload it. Or you could potentially do something um, offline in the editor where you collect all that information ahead of time and just give it like a file, like an INI file and say, here's all my maps. Uh, or you could just hand edit an INI file to kind of pull off the same concept here. But the thing is, is that you don't, you absolutely don't want to have to load an asset to ask questions about it. You just want to know certain things about your assets. In the case of gear um, that's applied to a rider on a quad or a bike, I want to know how many helmets he has available, what brands they are, um, I don't know. What else do we want to know about helmets? Pretty much it. Yeah, how many are available, what brand they are. I don't know if they have a logo or something that I need to, to get. I can put all that in the asset registry and then without loading a single asset, I can make one query and have a list of everything in the entire game. And what I mean by asset, just to be clear too, is, um, where is my blueprint? This is technically an asset, so it can have asset registry tags on it. So if you have a bunch of blueprints sitting there that are your items for a role-playing game, that are your items that you're gonna spawn in the world, those are all assets, and you're gonna spawn them because they're assets. Now you can add extra data to them to ask specific questions about them. Um, what else about it? Uh, there's just a few tricks to actually using the asset registry. And unfortunately, as far as I have seen, nothing is exposed to blueprints to use this system at all. It's a C++ only thing. 
Uh, so the easiest way to do it is create a base asset in C++ that is simple, super simple. And the only thing it's going to have on it is a few properties with asset registry searchable. And then use that as your base, make a blueprint off of him, and now that is a searchable type later. And then again, doing the query, there's no nothing exposed to blueprints to query against the asset registry. So you have to write another C++ function that will help you gather up all the assets that you need, and then you can expose that back to blueprints and uh, ask questions about your data on disk. Has anyone come up with any sort of plugin or thing on the marketplace? That There's a, uh, on the marketplace, I saw this like super plugin where dude literally just went through and exposed like every system he could think of to blueprints. So that dude might have asset registry like searchable functions. Unfortunately, you still can't mark something as asset registry searchable other than in C++ because it happens at the metadata generation time. So when the game compiles is when it knows, when it knows how to, when it knows and what it knows to do with that stuff. You actually, you might be able to cheat. So there is a function that it calls instead of, if you don't have any properties defined, there's another function that it calls called get asset registry tags. Mm -hmm. You could uh, potentially make a function that called out the blueprints, ask for your property tags, came back in, and then built up something. But you'd still need some C++ to do that. So all I wanted to show you is, um, you probably can't even read that, huh? How do you make them bigger in Xcode? Uh, I'll make that window its own thing, where, where your code is. Yeah, and then like that too. How do you make the text bigger? Oh, uh, just try Command plus. I tried that, it made uh, weird noises. <laughs> command greater than? I don't know. <laughs> Xcode has its own key map. All right, no anyway. All I was going to say is if you can kind of see this, if you say asset registry searchable in your U property list, that's all it takes. And now it's now it's data that you can query uh, when it's packaged at runtime. How do you query against it? Uh, that one, I actually don't have a snippet example of that because it's not fun. But let me pull up the, uh, where did my window go? Uh, a lot of times when I'm trying to figure out how to use something, Epic is already using it. So I literally just search for the name of the thing, and they have an example of how to use it, and I just crib that example, copy and paste it into my thing, and change two things and go with it. So uh, that's the keyword that we just talked about. Um, where's the class? Oh, it's F asset registry module, sorry. So now we're getting into C++ documentation, so this is super fun. Um, so there's, there's nothing built in that really that wraps any of this stuff at all? Hmm. Nope. You just have to call the whole thing. Um, what this is trying to say is, what's up? Yeah. All right, so basically this I asset registry, I asset registry. Um, there's other cool stuff you can do with it too. Like there's functions that are called every time an asset is added, removed, deleted, whatever. So if you're making editor plugins, you can hook right into the asset registry and you can do things when assets have been dragged and dropped in. You can listen for things and do custom stuff there. Um, basically there is a this get assets this. they have like get assets is the core function this get assets you call it and it takes an, uh, an array that it's going to populate with all the assets that it found based on this far filter which is F asset registry filter um, that's like the most intense one where you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. You can say, I want classes that have these as parent classes, that have these tags defined, that, um, oh, that's probably it, that have these tags defined. So you can like build like almost like a, a database query against your assets that you're asking questions against. Otherwise, you can do stuff by saying like, just give me the assets by class. So give me every asset that is this class. And then you could loop through them 
and you can go nuts with whatever you want when you when you find that stuff. Um, if there's more interest in it offline later, I could actually update a code snippet into like one of the slides or in the notes or something like that when I upload them. So it'd be available with a quick code snippet on how to use this. Like we do a, a tiny little GitHub repo. Yeah, like, like a show notes repo or something. Uh, cool. So without spending any more time, there's one gotcha about the asset registry that destroyed my life for all of a day. So it wasn't that bad. <laughs> Uh, back in 4.10, everything you put into the asset registry was just in a packaged build. It just was always there. You didn't have to do anything special. Um, when they went to 4.11, and it might have been a point release, and I'm pretty sure it was 4.11, they started stripping all the asset registry tags out of the final build because it's massive. There's a lot of crap there that you don't need. So what they did, thankfully, is they added... Um, under default engine.ini, if you add a block that says asset registry, and I'm actually going to go find theirs. Uh, where's the engine at in a, in a Mac? Uh, library. I have no idea where the uh, engine source is. That. You'd have to, um, maybe in Xcode, you pull up an engine source file, and then you get to it that way. Oh, configs right here. This is what I need anyway. Cool. Uh, in this base engine.ini, um, this is actually a pro tip too. Anything that's defined in any INI, you can override. So if you ever want to know how to start changing the functionality of how Unreal Engine works, start poking at INI files and putting random values in there, and all kinds of fun stuff happens. <laughs> it also breaks things very easily because it's very picky about this. <laughs> right. Uh, so here's the asset registry block, and they even have a comment here that says fill this out um, to, in cook builds, we won't strip these, right? So they have a blacklist that you can add, cooked tags blacklist, and by default, what is fib and fib data? That's a new one to me. I didn't see that before. That's cool. Um, parent class, generated class, gameplay queue name. So they have to use the asset registry themselves to figure out certain things about blueprints that they load. So they add it to this list so that it's there and their code's able to use this at runtime to determine things about your blueprints themselves. Uh, you can extend this and add anything and everything you want here. And then when your game is cooked, packaged on disk, you can then use the asset registry and still ask questions about your data. Uh, at that point, does it strip out the unnecessary stuff? From the yeah, anything that's not in that list will not be searchable. So you have to so add it to the list. Well, um, Was that, like, that blacklist? Yeah, the white list were the ones right oh, below yeah, the blacklist. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you have to create a combination of a white and black list to say include these tags in because I'm actually going to use them in a package ship build. And then it's easiest just in your in your default engine I, I instead of editing the base engine one, uh, default engine overloads base engine. Anything you put like an additional whitelist tags here in this asset registry, um, they'll just get added. So then when you package your game, it's all available. And just to kind of put that mapping uh, that people aren't aware, when you go into the project settings, for example, and you change the game mode or uh, something like that or a setting, those are always written out for INI files and you'll always find those in your config uh, folder. Um, and you can go modify them further. Um, yeah, I spent a lot of time on that because it's super, it's super helpful. It saves you writing a lot of code, and you don't have to load assets to find things out. It, it, it's based on the package. In the package game, it's based on the package. Um, other things, yeah, it just goes and opens the package descriptor, finds like an offset, says go and read the next 200 characters out of it, and give you that back as an array I can search. So. It doesn't have to load everything. It just pulls the package and asks it, give me all of your asset registry stuff. Um, it's also potentially and probably going to be a great system for DLC because when you get DLC, you probably want to ask questions about what DLC is inside of your package. If you asset registry it, you can have a downloadable content and you can ask questions about it before it's loaded. Uh, this is an easy one after the heavy asset registry. Um, so. If you're working with landscape, 
I don't know if you've ever seen this, but sometimes in the editor, you'll be walking on your landscape, and you'll just fall through the world for no reason. And then you'll stop the game and you'll restart it, and you may or may not fall through the world in that same spot. Um, this happens to us all the damn time. In, in 412, 412, it's happening less, so it's getting better. But if you ever find yourself in a scenario where for your guy just falls through the world, there's two ways to fix it. The easiest way is in the editor. If you hit the tilde key, you get a little console, just like in the runtime if you hit the tilde key or the back tick, I guess it is, right? If you just hit the, t the key next to the one on the keyboard, it pulls up a little console. If you type recreate landscape collision into that box, it regenerates your landscape collision and you will not fall through the world, at least for the that play session. Um, another way to fix it when it's doing that is you get out a landscape brush and you click and then you undo and that forces the collision to regenerate and you won't fall through the world. <laughs> uh, it'll happen in the, when the game is run if you're doing play in editor like if you just have the editor open and you hit the play button and then you're walking around you can still fall through there too like that's where you're gonna be falling through. No it will not happen in a package game. Um, so there's some weird stuff with the way it generates collision when they're doing play and editor, and it copies things around. So whenever in doubt, it's probably not your landscape because if it visually looks like it's supposed to be there and you fall through it, run recreate landscape collision, and you probably won't fall through it again. Um, it's just a time saver. Macros, functions, events. Uh, we've went over this a lot, so I just want to go over um, when it's a good time to use it and just real high level. So an event cannot return data, but it can delay. The game can be delayed based on an event. You want to do something later, you can fire an event and then the action can be handled later. Versus a function is immediate. As soon as you call the function, it's immediate. Um, a function can return data. It has simple local variables, meaning that you just add variables like you would to any blueprint and those local variables exist in the scope of that function and they're there for that function to use. And they're standalone, meaning if you create a function library, which there's a type in the editor called blueprint function library, and you make a function and somebody uses that function and then you later go back and edit that function, as long as you recompile your blueprint function library, everyone's using your new function right then and there. So that's what I mean by standalone. They, they're their own thing that gets, that gets called. A macro can have multiple return values, which is super cool. Uh, you can actually do local variables in it, and I can show someone that if they want to know, because this is something that Austin taught me. I had no idea. Um, so you can't have local variables in, in macros, uh, but everyone who uses it has to recompile it whenever you change it. So if you have a macro library and you make a change and you have 7,000 assets that are all using your macro, you have to open every single one of those 7,000 assets and recompile them. Otherwise, they'll be using the old macro. The so. reason why that is is because a macro, unlike a function, is just a collapsed version of blueprint node graph. So when you drop in a macro, it's inserting that, that code directly into your blueprint. So even though there's like one source of truth, air quotes, that the first time you drop that macro into a blueprint, it's, it's there. It's, it's there. It's a, and it's a valid so code. <laughs> unreal to, to update it. Yep. So that's just something we all just want to look out for. And then timers. Um, timers can call a function or event on completion. So, you know, timers and events go hand in hand when you want to do delayed things. Uh, you cannot pass a parameter out of a timer or into a timer. You can't say, like, grab this variable, wait five seconds, return this variable. But you could emulate that by being clever with your blueprints in a different way. Oh yeah? yeah? Right on. So, or just learn C++ and you can do that. <laughs> um, but timers can call events and then even though events, you know, like are specific and the event that comes out of a timer takes no parameters, when it calls the event, you're in your own blueprint chain where you can go and collect the variables that you need and then call a function to do something immediately. So um, those are kind of your control flow, little, little helpers and stuff. And uh, if anyone wants to know about that local variable thing, I can show them here. But I want to power through a couple more real quick. Uh, localization. 
no one thinks about localization until it's too late. And then you have to go back and change a lot of stuff. So I'm not gonna go deep into localization because it is a can of worms. But what I wanna say is if you have a thing that you think needs to be localized and is displayed on the screen in a UMG or something like that, use an F-text. F-text is localizable. No other type of string in the game is. If you have metadata on an actor that eventually is going to tell a UMG screen to render the name, like I name my thing, helmet, for instance, we'll go with the part thing, I name my thing gloves. Um, if that's an F-text, I can then send that to UMG, it'll be localized later via magic process. So when in doubt, use F-text. Um, cool thing they added in 4.12 is whenever you see an F-text variable, either in a blueprint or on the, on the side, there's a little tick next to it now, and if you click that, it pops up a box that says namespace, and you can type something in there. All this is gonna help you do is eventually to localize your game, you're going to dump a giant manifest of hundreds of thousands of strings, and you have no context about what that string is or where it came from. With the namespace, you can now put in like, this is a, this is a helmet type, this is a this, this is a that. Then when you dump your big table, it'll be in that big table with that extra data, which then is probably gonna help the people you're paying to localize know what the hell this thing is supposed to be and make a better decision about how to localize it, as well as you're gonna know what the hell it is too when you're looking at a CSV file with hundreds of thousands of entries if you have that much text in your game. And then uh, when you're working in code, I just wanted to call this out. There's a class called the F Text Inspector. Um, you're gonna to wanna to use that in C++. It's the only way to figure out what your namespace and source key is that's associated with your localized text. So if you ever wanna say, give me the namespace of this thing in code because I'm gonna do something with it, F Text Inspector is the only way to get that. F Text itself does not care what his namespace or key is, he only cares about what value he stores. If you wanna do crazy stuff with localization in C++, you're gonna need the F Text Inspector. Uh, these other ones, I just want to post the links here and go over real high level. Um, this guy, I found this article. We were, we we're looking into like, hey, I want to do 3D user interface, and it seems like I have a scene capture node. I have, I have everything I would need to do 3D user interface. That should be easy. Well, no, it's not. It's a big pain in the ass because <laughs> you don't have the things that you need. You have almost the things that you need, and it will drive you crazy trying to make 3D user interface. This guy. Hands down, best approach. I researched this topic for two weeks, and this guy pretty much nails it with everything that we tried. Um, the basic top-level ideas is you need a scene capture node. You're going to put an object in your scene. You're going to put a green screen behind it. You're going to write a custom post process that actually tells it not to do tone mapping and not to do some of the other like fancy stuff on your scene capture because when you render it later, it's gonna get tone mapped and anti-aliased again. You create a material for your guy with the green screen that's gonna alpha out the green and make it now alpha transparent. And then in this guy's example, he actually adds a little bit of math on a dot product to kind of bring the edges in even more so you don't see the green fuzziness. Um, then you're going to render that texture or you're going to take that material that you created that does the alpha and you're going to render that with UMG onto like a canvas panel. And then you can now put it in the, in the game as a UI widget. So like a good example of this is like Star Fox do a barrel roll. You want your dude like talking in the corner. You can have him outside of the skybox hanging out in the world or down below the world or above the world with a camera pointed at him and you can render him on the screen. The downside to this approach is you are chroma keying, you are color keying. There will be jaggies. It sucks. There's nothing you can do about it. So alternatively, don't use an alpha background. Build a scene behind it. And then if you need a window with a scene behind it, like for a little talking dialogue, you're golden with this guy's approach. Um, I wanted to just point to this article real quick. Actually, I already had it open. Did it just reopen it? So he goes through, uh, pull the presentation down, and you can see kind of how he's starting to set up his stuff, pointing the camera at the green screen. There's some intricate 3D object that has animations on it. Um, then he goes through and 
sets up his post process. And where's the end result? There's a lot of steps. And then he's doing a UMG where he took that texture with his thing rendered. If you look really carefully, which you actually can't even see it there, there's a little bit of green, a little fuzzy around the edges, so it's not perfect. And then the final thing, they render this intricate 3D object right onto the edge of the screen and they control it with animations, but it's being rendered as a UMG widget on top of everything because they captured it off in the distance. Um, really great. Uh, you're doing a whole extra scene capture and compositing it twice, so it's an extra render pass. Um, you're going to pay for it a little bit. It might not be that bad, but you're going to pay for it. Additionally, um, you're losing some kind of depth information. You're projecting a different field of view onto a 3D object that you're putting onto the screen. So if you're trying to like probably use it for some VR stuff, it's going to look super wonky and it's going to freak you the fuck out because it's not going to be in the same perspective as like the camera that you're looking through. Um, upside though is it's not going to motion blur when you move around and other stuff like that. Uh, so I think this guy's write-up is spot on. It's the best one I found. Um, researched that task for far too long. Where are my slides? Uh, on the other desktop. Yeah, where are my slides? <laughs> there they are. Uh, last one, and I don't want to spend any time talking about this, but if you want to know about it, talk to me offline. Um, but I'll, I'll explain why you might want this and why you might want to bug an engineer to write this for you. So in Blueprint, there's no way to just take a random struct in as an input into your thing. And why you might want to do this, uh, our example is we want to have data that we pass to the UI and we don't want to have to keep writing a million different versions of those data descriptors by making struct A, struct B, struct C, struct D, struct E, and then making a blueprint function that takes struct A, struct B, struct C, struct G, so on and so forth. Uh, we just want a function that takes a struct of anything of any type. You can actually do it. This guy posted on the Unreal Engine forums. And you have to write some C++, and it's called custom thunk, and it's a, it's a property on the U function. What it lets you do is when it calls this next thing, right after you say custom thunk, you say declare function, and it has exec, and then the name of the function that you just marked as custom thunk. And what it's going to do is in the scope of the virtual machine, it's going to call your function with two parameters, a stack and something else that I forget. Then unlike the rest of the engine where you can just grab your parameters off and do what you want with them as function parameters, you have to actually push and pop things off of a virtual machine stack to find the object that you're looking for. Then you can pass it through to a helper function which can use reflection to then inspect your struct. So if I had a million structs using reflection, I can then find the name of the thing, find the value of the thing, and then tell my UI to render a text box with its name and value, and it works with any struct under the sun you can throw at it. It's super powerful. It's the coolest thing that I think I wrote this year, and it's all in this blog post, or this forum post, with a working example that you can copy and paste. We'll just log it. So you can see in his blueprint, he has this receive some struct over here, and this thing that says any struct literally will take anything. You do a make color, make test struct, make, make vector, make anything. You can plug it in and then you can ask questions and write code to handle that stuff. Um, I don't know where else you might want to use that other than like user interface. I can't think of another like really good scenario. Um, but it's super awesome and it's also cool because you get to mess with. Uh, I've done in the past, I used to work with a lot of Lua code and write Lua bindings from hand like from by scratch not using any helpers and if you've ever done that it's the same way where you're manipulating a function call stack and pulling things off and pushing things back and shuffling through them and then you can do some stuff that you can't do because when you're writing the code that's inside of this declare function block this is all running in a virtual machine that's garbage collected and weak referenced and you can do crazy stuff in here and you can also crash the engine with like one wrong line of code and never know why you crash the engine because it's encoded after it's compiled to something you'd never be able to debug. Um, so if anyone wants that, hit me up on Slack. We'll probably have a show notes thing where I get to add some more stuff um, to it with some more examples. And that's all I got. But sharing is caring. 
if you have any pro tips that you want to just shout out or you want to come up here and just like demo a quick little hack in, in the Unreal editor, feel free. But I think I'm done. We have questions. Cool. I would say that was really in depth. Thank you. I mean, yeah, no problem. Awesome. Well, if there's no questions, then.